Welcome to 132 Problems Revisiting Mormon Polygamy, where we explore the scriptural, theological, and historical case for and against Mormon polygamy. I um, am so happy that you are here. We've had some great episodes lately, and I want to again remind people, invite people to please share this podcast and let people know to consider listening from the beginning so they can understand the journey we've taken, the scriptural case we've laid out, and how we've gotten where we are today. I also want to again so profoundly thank people people who have been willing to donate to this podcast. It is so incredibly helpful. Most of the donations that come in, I actually put back into the podcast. It's been wonderful to be able to see the audience growing, be able to spread this message. So please consider a donation since it really is helpful for all of us to be able to get get this information out there to the people who need it. I am so excited to finally be able to bring you this discussion today, the first of hopefully many discussions with Don Bradley. For those who have been following this topic, you he doesn't need any introduction. We'll talk a little bit more about who he is in the conversation. Thank you so much for joining us as we take this deep dive into the murky waters of Mormon polygamy. Welcome to this episode. I hope that if all of the sound and video works all right. We're using a different <laughs> um, format this time, but I am happy to finally be here <laughs> for my first conversation with Don Bradley. This has been a very long time in the making. So um, I think for most of my audience, Don probably needs um, very little introduction, but I do know, Don, I'll just share what I know about you and then you can fill in any oh, details sure. I missed. Sure. Don did his undergrad in history at BYU and his master's at Utah State, I believe, and did a thesis yeah. in early Mormonism. What was it specifically? It was My master's thesis was called American Proto-Zionism in the Book of Lehi. So it was actually about early American, early 19th century attempts to gather the Jews to the United States and how that provided a context in which the Book of Mormon was first understood. Okay, okay. Thank you for, yeah, I, I guess I guess I now know why I didn't remember that title. So <laughs> anyway, I know that since, well, I guess before you did your master's, you were the research assistant for Brian Hales to, yeah. to do his, um, like you did his, the, the groundwork, you did the historical work for his um, books, Joseph Smith's Polygamy, his trilogy. I, I gathered most of the sources, yeah. Right. Okay. And then I believe since then you've written a book called the hundred the hundred sixteen pages. If, am I getting the title right on that? The should... last one hundred sixteen pages reconstructing the Book of Mormon's missing stories. So yeah, so that's about what we can know from the historical record about what was in the last one hundred sixteen pages of the Book of Mormon. Fascinating. Okay. And so that's all wonderful. I guess most of my audience would know the reason Don Bradley is here is because he is, well, I guess you're the self-described foremost researcher on Joseph's polygamy. And so since you are the one who did most of the research, find, gathered the sources for Brian Hales. Mm -hmm. So um, so I, I know you're considered quite an expert on the historical research, but my understanding, well, as Don and I have spoken several times and tried to kind of um decide what we what we could discuss don expressed yeah. that for this conversation he wanted to talk about faith about navigating faith kind of regarding this topic am i introducing that all right don did i do that correctly yeah yeah exactly yeah okay it, go ahead i'm yeah. sorry and if i left yeah, anything so after <laughs> introduction go ahead and share that as well yeah thank you so much michelle so yeah um so i uh, i understand that when people have faith questions and doubts, those are often triggered by all different things, things that people wrestle with. And I understand that polygamy is one of them. And I know this because it's been one in my own wrestling, right? And so I first encountered faith questions about a variety of things as a teenager when I was 17, went through a kind of faith crisis, which is really painful to me at that time and then later on in my adult yeah go ahead now for you polygamy wasn't part of that right I've, we've heard your story on different platforms but polygamy wasn't so, really central to that as much as just polygamy wasn't part of my polygamy wasn't central to my 
initial faith crisis when I was a teenager, it actually did play a substantial role in my more serious faith crisis as an adult that led to me leaving the church. And maybe, um, maybe I can come back to that. Okay. A little bit later. So uh, yeah, it, it, it was one of my issues. Uh, I, so I actually formally left the church at that time. I left the church for five years. I put in a letter resigning my church membership and polygamy was one of the issues involved in my leaving. And then, uh, you know, later I found my way back to the church. I uh, was, I found more things in the history that were more positive and I reconsidered the spiritual experiences that I had and found my way back. Um, so I, Can I ask, realized, oh, uh, yeah, when you, when you struggled and when you left, was that yeah. primarily, um, questions about the existence of God or just questions about the veracity of the book of Mormon and, and Joseph Smith, like how, you know, where were you on that spectrum? So at the time that I left, I had lost faith in everything, really. Okay. I'd lost faith in the, re I'd lost faith in the restoration first. And then I lost belief in God as well. Okay. And it wasn't until that point that I decided that I would leave the church when I when I really didn't believe in any of it. Um, okay. And so uh, so I know that in a lot of I know what it's like to go through questions about faith, and I know a lot of the the pain that's involved. Obviously, every person's journey is unique, right? And the questions that they face and the the, how they wrestle with those. Um, but because I know that, you know, po polygamy itself is a big topic for a lot of people, since in a future episode or two, we're planning on talking about, like, why is it that I think that Joseph Smith practiced polygamy? And I know that I I've heard arguments. I haven't heard you make these arguments, Michelle, but I have heard others in conversation make arguments that if Joseph Smith practiced polygamy, then he couldn't have been a true prophet because polygamy is wrong. And so since in future episodes, I want to address why do I think that Joseph Smith practiced polygamy? Why do I think that the evidence points that way? I, I'm not about trying to uh, produce faith crisis for people, quite the opposite, right? I, I know how painful that is. And so I don't want to, you know, contribute to those kinds of struggles for people. So I'd like to, that's why I asked to maybe talk more about faith issues surrounding polygamy first in this episode. And then later on, we can get into the nitty gritty of the historical sources. Okay. Okay. So if I can um, tell me if I'm restating your, your concerns or your position adequately sure. that, and sure. accurately. So you feel like you, the last thing you want to do is challenge people's faith is lead people into um, you know, their faith deconstructing or being lost. And, and so you, you don't want to do that, but polygamy is one of the issues that tends to do that. So you're in the, um, like the awkward position of arguing <laughs> in favor of Joseph's polygamy based on the evidence, but not wanting that to affect people's faith negatively. Have I restated that all right? Yes. That's a pretty okay. good restatement. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. And so, so what Don and I kind of just talked about as, as we were trying to do, um, decide what Don wanted to come on and talk about um, was um, talking about kind of navigating faith in these different models and these different perspectives. So I'll let you go ahead and share some of your thoughts, Don, of, of what you wanted to share. And then maybe I can sure. share some of my thoughts. OK, please. Yeah, I'd love to have this be a conversation. Um, could, could I start with talking just about some of my own personal history when it comes to this subject? Okay. Yeah. Um, I think, a part, sure. I think people are probably somewhat familiar with it, but yeah, you go ahead. Cause not everyone will be. So. Yeah. So I, um, I first, I mean, growing up as a Latter-day Saint, um, my parents were converts, so I don't have any like pioneer heritage. There, there aren't, you know, Mormon polygamists in my family tree, right. I'm a second generation Latter-day Saint, but, um, I remember we lived out in the so-called mission field, right? We weren't in Utah. Uh, my dad was the bishop in South Bend, Indiana. And um, I was a well-informed LDS kid, 
and yeah, I listened at church and so on. So one Sunday we had someone call on the phone to ask questions of the bishop because he wanted to know more about the church. And I'm 12 years old. And I said to the guy, oh, well, you, you, could, you could ask your questions to me. <laughs> Obviously, I had great confidence in myself at 12, right? And so he asked me a series of questions. And um, one of the questions, I think I largely answered his questions correctly. But one of the questions that he asked me was um, something about Joseph Smith. Uh, he, the guy had been also talking to the reorganized church. He was investigating the LDS church and the RLDS church at the same time. And so some of his questions were geared to that. And so he asked me some question about Joseph Smith and polygamy. And I remember distinctly what my answer was. My answer was, well, that wasn't Joseph Smith. That was Brigham Young. Well, oh, okay. So you grew up thinking Brigham Young started polygamy. And Joseph I, I grew didn't. up thinking that Brigham Young started polygamy, not Joseph Smith. I had never heard that Joseph Smith had practiced polygamy. I, when I was hearing about polygamy as a child, I was always hearing about Brigham Young having so many wives, right? Okay. And so um, somewhere around that time, my mom was actually teaching early morning seminary there in South Bend. And in the curriculum, she got to some part in the, the church history manual for the students about early Mormon polygamy. And she struggled with it mightily. It just did not fit for her with, you know, as she, when she had joined the church, it made all the sense in the world to have, you know, your, your spouse for eternity, to have your children sealed to you for eternity. She cared so much for family, right? But then the idea that, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, um, it's not just you and your husband, it's you and your husband and these other women, right? That he's, he's divided between you and these other women. That really, that she struggled with that so much that she, I don't know how she got this information, but she called up um, a BYU professor. Somehow she got the number for Larry Porter at BYU, okay. who then taught church history and talked to him. And she, she told me later that he had said to her, well, we don't know how this all works out. He, he seemed sympathetic to what she was saying. We don't know how this all works out, but whatever it is, it's for our good or something like that, right? But she just, she could never believe that this is how things would be in the celestial kingdom was that it would be polygamy to her. It was just so obvious it would be monogamy, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I did not hear that just the idea that Joseph Smith had practiced polygamy until I was 15. I was in my teacher's quorum and our teacher's quorum instructor was a doctor who he did a lot of reading. And so he was reading a biography of Joseph Smith. And um, I think it was Joseph Smith, the first Mormon by Donna Hill. And um, he, he was saying something to our teacher's quorum about Joseph Smith and his conflict with Emma over polygamy and how difficult it was. And I piped up and I said, Joseph Smith didn't practice polygamy. That was Brigham Young. <laughs> And he said, no, Joseph Smith started it. He said, go home and read DNC 132. Okay, and I was so going to ask, where did you I think 132 and, came from? Okay. I, I went home and read 132. And I saw that, you know, it was, it's a, a addressed up front to Joseph Smith. Then it's saying, you know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David, and Solomon, you know, had four wives. And then it's saying, you know, like, to it's somewhat vague at parts but it's saying for emma to receive all those who've been given to my servant joseph and so i thought well okay i guess you know joseph smith did practice polygamy I, I was mistaken and um you know later in my teenage years i started really a couple years later i started actually doing church history research going to the church archives i actually encountered like the um at the library and stuff, I actually had encountered literature from Mormon fundamentalists, right? The modern day polygamists. And so that got me researching more into the history of polygamy and wanting to understand, you know, like, is this early, early brethren, quote unquote, right? Like early LDS leaders had taught that some of them that polygamy was essential to our exaltation. And so I wanted to know, is, is that true? Right? I had a big I had some real doctrinal questions and it was doctrinal questions like that, that initially got me looking into the historical questions. I, 
I became a historian of, of Mormonism, but I started out not with an interest in history, but with an interest in doctrine, right? Trying mm, to understand okay. what's, what's true about God, what's true about the celestial kingdom, you know, so, so polygamy was just one of those various questions that I had. And then, um, you know, so, so like I said, I did have a faith crisis as a teenager, but that was centered on, I had actually discovered this book that B.H. Roberts had written as a sort of devil's advocate case against the historicity of the Book of Mormon called Studies yeah. of the Book of Mormon. And that threw me for a loop. Um, so that was what led to that teenage faith crisis. Then when I was uh, in my 20s, like mid 20s, I started finding other things in my research that raised questions that I didn't have answers for. Right. Okay. Uh, a whole variety of questions. So, so one thing I like to say is that, like, when we read someone else's book on some aspect of church history, they have made sense of everything for us, whether they've done it well or not. They've made sense of things for us intellectually and spiritually. But when you're doing your own church history research, of course, it falls on you to make sense of things intellectually and spiritually. And so I was. I had trouble making sense of some of these things, particularly spiritually that I was finding in my research. Um, and so I um, sort of, I, I stopped believing in stages kind of, I, I would stop believing in this thing that Justin had taught and then this other thing. And, you know, this other thing would be called into question, you know, well, maybe the book of Abraham doesn't match the papyri. Maybe the book of Abraham is not historical. And then, you know, something else would be called into question. And so when I, by the time that I left the church officially, um, I had amassed, you know, a number of problem areas. And so I, when I wrote my letter resigning my church membership, I, I listed several of these. I, I put several of what I saw as the big ones. And one of those was Joseph Smith's polygamy. Okay. So I, I wrote that, um, you know, I, I wrote about what I saw as like moral problems with his polygamy and just briefly, right? Because I was sort of doing a bullet points thing in this letter, but I, I was actually trying to close the door on coming back to the church. I thought, well, someday I might, you know, want to come back to the church and I don't think I should. I don't think it's true. So I'm going to try to shut that door by sort of bearing my anti-testimony in this letter, yeah. right? And so polygamy, ask, what, polygamy was one of those things. Can I just ask you a question? Yeah. I'm sure. curious to know why um, why Brigham's polygamy seemed okay to you and Joseph Smith's polygamy seemed like a deal breaker or was part of your list of the deal breakers. Like, I'd like to understand that a little better because yeah. they're both the same church, you know? They're the same church. So I think that... It was multiple things. I, I mean, in my experience, a lot more people struggle with the idea that Joseph practiced polygamy than the idea that Brigham did. Um, and I think that is partly because when people, um, a lot of people have the idea that, well, Joseph Smith had polygamy revealed to him, but maybe he didn't really practice it. He, he either didn't practice it or maybe he he had women sealed to him, but he didn't have sex with them or whatever. But then Brigham, you know, clearly fully practices that he's got a bunch of wives, he's got a bunch of descendants through polygamy, right? And so I think that people often are skeptical that like, well, isn't it convenient that the guy who starts the religion and has these revelations has a revelation that gives him a bunch of women? And so um, it seems you know, that the sort of natural take on that is a, is a cynical one, right? That, well, you know, hmm, how convenient, you know? And I think I, I had some of that. And also um, the, the documents that we have talking about Joseph Smith and polygamy, it's very messy, right? Because you've got like, with, with obviously I'm, I'm these, this would get into things that we're going to talk about more in future episodes, but like, you know, the, the reports about Joseph Smith and Fanny Alger, or apparently the family says Alger, Fanny Alger, um, like it's, it was even ambiguous in the sources. 
what the nature of the relationship was, right? So, so a number of people thought that it was adulterous, while other people thought that it was polygamous. You know, with, with or some people Young, think it wasn't either. Just I just right. have thrown some people think it's not either. Sure. Okay, right. Well, I mean, for people, right? For people who think that there was a re uh, relationship okay. there, like a full blown relationship. So, um, the um, with Brigham, it's like it's fairly cut and dried that he practiced polygamy, but with Joseph, the waters are muddier about you know, like the reported relationships, what was the nature of the relationships with Brigham? We don't have, for instance, like polyandry, whereas in Joseph's marriages, we have reported polyandry, right? Well, and we have Brigham's so, own teaching of trading up. We like, have Brigham's teaching of trading up. Yeah, for sure. And for, so, yeah. And so, we have, and we have mm -hmm. Brigham giving away very, very young. We have the yeah, um, there are absolutely called? ethical problems with Brigham's polygamy. And in fact, Brigham's polygamy looks um, far more authoritarian and patriarchal than what's reported about Joseph. Right? Mm -hmm. um, but it, it does seem like because Joseph is a more foundational figure, he's the founder of the church, okay. that if people think that Joseph went astray on this or joseph's behavior was problematic then it tends to raise more foundational questions about the restoration altogether okay so i want so to dig into and, that, and that's and that's where i was is what i'm saying okay that's where you, i was yeah. do you mind if we pause on this point because i think it's actually a really yeah. crucial like it's something that that i think there's a lot of discussion about and 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 yeah. i would like to kind of drill down in it so um sure. It's interesting because on the one hand, I hear people say, um, well, if people start saying that Brigham Young started polygamy instead of Joseph Smith, that destroys faith and causes people to leave the church. Mm. And and I've heard I've heard several people say that, you know, and mm. I find that to be a really interesting perspective that doesn't make much sense to me. Right. Mm. Because okay. what I'm hearing, like, I think you and um, the guys at Word Radio talked quite a bit about that, you know, mm. and what I'm hearing is that the kind of the idea is if people thought that it was just Brigham Young that was a polygamist, that didn't destroy their faith. It was finding mm -hmm. out that Joseph Smith was a polygamist yeah. that destroyed their faith. So that's what I'm hearing yeah. you say. So I'm wanting to understand why you think that was the case a little more. You know, I understand why I understand why coming to believe this about Joseph Smith destroys faith. I'm wanting to understand better why it was OK if when it was Brigham Young. Right. And then mm -hmm. because then I feel like when we're getting back to saying, hey, it actually was Brigham Young was okay over here and it didn't destroy faith but all of a sudden over here there's talking about how that will destroy faith while at the same time kind of ignoring the massive amount of faith that has been destroyed by the joseph smith polygamy narrative like i think that has been one of the huge things that has led most people that, that's at least been i would say like the book of abraham and polygamy are two huge components in people losing their mm -hmm. you know having to deconstruct all of their faith about the restoration it starts in usually polygamy so do, do you get what i'm saying like if it was a, like why was it okay over here before your faith transition before you knew it was joseph why were you okay with brigham young as the second prophet in the restoration as we believe it the one who had all of the keys and passed them on you know because that's some of the pushback i get is that if, mm -hmm. if i say that polygamy is wrong then how can the church be anything how can there be anything right in the church? And so yeah. I'm wanting to understand why you weren't bothered by the idea of Brigham Young. Did you just not know as much about it? Did you not know that he and John Taylor and many others taught that it was absolutely essential for salvation, that, that if the mm -hmm. church ever led, left polygamy, they would be in apostasy? Like, were you just less mm -hmm. familiar with it? Do you think? So I think that, um, you know, when we're bothered by something, that's an emotion, right? And I think that often we don't necessarily even understand the roots of our own emotions. Why does one thing bother us and another not? If I were to look at, to try to understand, well, why wasn't I so bothered, right? That Brigham Young practiced polygamy. I mean, for one thing, I was just raised with that narrative all the time. I mean, the name Brigham Young is practically synonymous with polygamy. You know, if you were to ask, you know, a hundred non-Mormons, you know, what's the first word that pops to mind with polygamy? I mean, a lot of them might say Utah or something, but 
a lot of them, and some might say just Mormon or whatever, a lot of them would say polygamy or wives or something, you know, Brigham Young is really known for this. And so I, I grew up with a, a, such a consistent narrative about Brigham Young, whereas it was only later on that I heard that Joseph Smith practiced polygamy, right? So, okay. so, so that Brigham Young was a polygamist was just kind of a given. It was just understood. And then um, since Brigham Young was not the founder of the faith, right? He didn't start the church. He didn't, he wasn't the key figure in getting the restoration off the ground. Then, you know, what he does, I think in, in some ways does come under less scrutiny than what mm -hmm. Joseph Smith does, right? Because people are naturally, I think, more skeptical of someone who is putting forward more extraordinary claims. So if you're starting a religion, right, and you're saying, I had these visions, God told me to do this, um, that's a big deal, obviously, you know. And so if someone seems to be making self-serving claims along as part of those religious claims, then it can raise more questions about the whole enterprise of what they're doing. Well, is this person starting this religion in order to, you know, get, get what they want in this way or that way? Okay, so so can I ask then, because it's interesting sure. to hear you describe this, because I and many others that I've heard from, just like polygamy and Brigham Young went together for you, like polygamy and Mormonism went together for me and Joseph Smith was the founder of the religion and Joseph Smith dictated 132 and Joseph Smith, like I, I just knew my whole life that Joseph Smith mm, okay. restored polygamy, right? Like yeah. that wasn't a question for me, just the same okay. way it wasn't with for you with Brigham Young. Okay. And maybe that's just a difference of being descended from polygamists and raised in Utah mm -hmm. or you, you know like like that yeah. wasn't a question yeah and um so okay. what I'm hearing you say is Brigham Young kind of gets a pass and mm -hmm. and since it was Joseph that originated it um he doesn't get the same pass so what I'm hearing also in you describing that is that you just naturally assumed that polygamy was wrong like if Joseph had these revelations they were self-serving and Brigham did this really wrong thing but he was just second in line so and i just knew it so it didn't bother me but i i i didn't i didn't assume up front that it was wrong it it always sounded it sounded weird to me when i heard about it as a kid that like Brigham Young had a bunch of wives it sounded weird i it didn't sound anything like what what went on in my mind right i was a little romantic i i fell in love with a girl the first day of second grade a girl in my class right i didn't fall in love with five girls i fell in love with one girl right so right. so the idea of polygamy sounded strange to me but i don't think that i put it in the box of like oh um i i, I don't think i put it in the box at the time of oh this is morally wrong i just found it strange when i found out that when i when i was pointed to dnc 132 I just assumed it was right. I was a very devout Latter-day Saint kid. And so I assumed, well, if Joseph Smith had a revelation on this, it must have been right. It was only later, uh, over the course of several years, as I studied it and looked into it, that I thought, ah. I, I, I just became more skeptical. And I wondered, you know, was this, what were the things that he was doing on the up and up? Was, was this out of sincere religious motives or was there some other motive behind it? Sure. And and just, I know we're jumping ahead in the story, so I want to let you get back mm -hmm. to it. Thanks for letting me talk, like understand oh, sure. this better. Where do you land on that now in terms of like both Brigham's and Joseph's polygamy? And now that you are more informed about the ages of some of the girls, some of the tactics used, at least our narrative about Joseph and then what we know mm -hmm. about Brigham Young, where mm -hmm. are you in terms of, is this, um, a, print, a true eternal celestial principle from God that they were enacting as prophets of God in righteousness or, mm -hmm. or somewhere else on the spectrum of understanding that. Yeah, so I've held a range of positions across time, right? So as I mentioned, um, when I was a teenager and then you know I was pointed to DNC 132, read through DNC 132, I just assumed this this was right, you know, because this was a revelation. 
And then as I delved into it later, I found that, you know, Brigham Young and John Taylor and Wilfred Woodruff and, you know, other early apostles and so on had taught that polygamy was essential to exaltation, or at least sometimes taught that. And I, so I started to wonder if that was true, you know, maybe polygamy was essential uh, for us. Maybe, maybe this is, I thought maybe this was how people live in the celestial kingdom. This is the celestial way. And then, um, you know, then came to more skepticism, right? Like I said about Joseph's polygamy that like, like I wasn't skeptical that he practiced it, but I was skeptical that it was right, you know, and that, that he was doing it out of sincere motives. And so I started to see um, the, I, I started looking at Mormon polygamy and thinking about inequality, right? That, you know, how, how one-sided it was. It, that had first occurred to me back when I was a teenager, right? But I hadn't maybe wrestled with it as fully as I, I hadn't wrestled with it nearly as fully as I did later. I started looking at the accounts of how Joseph proposed to various women and it seemed often very heavy handed that the women had the sense that their salvation depended on this or the salvation of others depended on this. Um, there was a, a lot of time pressure put on them. Um, there were other, the, the fact that Emma appeared to not know about it until after the fact, like bothered me immensely. Um, just that she, you know, um, there were enormous ethical problems here, right? That she, obviously she's going to feel betrayed, right? In this situation. And how should she feel if not betrayed, right? I, and so um, I had real problems with how it was practiced. And like I said, I saw that it was, I, I looked at how Mormon polygamy had been done and I thought this looks inherently patriarchal. It looks like it's, it's about the man and not about the women that it seemed androcentric, right? So um, the, the idea that was off, the rationale that was so often given for polygamy, the major rationale seemed to be that people used was, well, it, it produces a larger family kingdom, right? The man will have more children right more wives and children as if as if a the man is the only one here who matters the women don't matter because women don't have more children in polygamy right um yeah, the man is the one who matters him. it's it's about his glory it's about him being more highly exalted well jesus said he that exalts himself shall be a base and he that abases himself shall be exalted so we're not supposed to be trying to exalt ourselves we're trained to supposed to be humbling ourselves and serving god and serving others and so i i just had all kinds of problems with what i was seeing as the rationale for polygamy and the idea that like our eternal progression is really based primarily on like it's quantitative it's about the numbers right like you know, right. it's about who has the biggest kingdom and the greatest numbers. And that repulsed me, right? And and still mm -hmm. does. And so um, I moved into this space of really questioning, like I said, the sincerity of Joseph Smith's polygamy and thinking, yeah, this isn't, I, I just, I thought Mormon polygamy, if, if there was some way to practice Polyg polygamy or, or a non-monogamous relationship ethically this wasn't it that this was what what the early mormons had done was very patriarchal it was very one-sided it wasn't um it wasn't the way that it some it wasn't it godly yeah it didn't feel godly okay yeah. and so when i um so yeah so so i left the church and it was while i was outside of the church that I got asked by Brian Hales, whom I'd known from other research stuff several years earlier to do research on Joseph Smith and polygamy. So he was, he wanted to do a book 
Um, at the time, he was just thinking one book. He had we had no idea either of us what we were getting into, how many sources there were, any of that. <laughs> that it would be a long project. So he wanted to, you know, gather together every source that had ever been written. Um, well, let's see, every source that had ever been cited in anything that had ever been written on Joseph Smith and polygamy, and then see what other sources could be found. And so he, he was a doctor, as you know, I know you know, Brian. Um, and so he didn't have time to do that research. And so he hired me. And so for two years, this was my job. So I spent a lot of time at the LDS Church Archives. I went also to the BYU Archives, the U of U, Utah State, Utah State Historical Society. And there's research out at the Huntington Library. Um, I went Remind back to me again Yale what year University this was. twice. This was 2007, 2008. And so, so was the Joseph Smith Papers a thing well, it was yet? Well underway. Mm -hmm. it okay, was sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just wanted to know yeah, if you had that as a resource. It was an earlier stage, but it was going on, yeah. And okay. so, um, so the whole time that I was doing that research, I thought that Joseph Smith was a scoundrel. I, <laughs> I was outside the church. I actually thought that Joseph Smith's polygamy was about sex. Brian was coming, of course, from a very different vantage point. He he was literally singing with the choir, right? He was in the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. <laughs> and so he and I would meet every, I think it was Wednesday evening in the basement of the conference center after choir practice. And I would report my week's findings and give him photocopies and so on. And so, yeah, I was doing that research while I was outside the church and thought, you know, um, Joseph Smith's polygamy had been about sex. He and I really had very different views on Joseph Smith's polygamy, right? So he was viewing it at the time of the research, right? He was viewing it as, well, Joseph Smith is doing all of this just strictly out of obedience to God, right? And I was seeing it as it was libido, <laughs> right? And so... Um, but the, the research went extremely well. Um, you know, we gathered all the, what I believe at least at the time were all the known sources and found some new ones. And I, um, you know, it was subsequent to that, that I came back to the church. So- Can I ask was, you a question about your research sure. before we get back to you coming back yeah, to the sure. church? So I know that you said you have very different perspectives on Joseph, but um, you had the exact same perspective on the narrative, just different perspectives on the motives. Like you thought the same things happened. You just viewed them differently. Right. So I'm so curious. I, 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 I don't I don't know that I'd say the exact same perspective, but I think what you're getting at is we both thought that Joseph Smith did actually practice polygamy. Yes. Like the details, you ha you have the details in common. You both thought he did this thing, he did this thing because of this source. It shows he did this thing. It's just a matter of what was his reason and motivation for doing it, right? Like the question of was Fanny Alger an affair or was it a polygamous marriage, for example? So the question I have is, as you were doing all of this research, because there are other people that have been doing a lot of research, like, for example, The Prices, their first book came out in, tw in mm -hmm. 2000. So mm -hmm. was that something you researched as you were looking? Did you did you look at their sources? Because because it's not sure. that mm -hmm. it's yeah. like like so you did read the prices books and compile yeah. the, their sources as well yes. and get them to mm -hmm. Brian because I haven't. Mm -hmm. OK, OK. So tell me what you thought yeah. about about um, a lot of their research and their sources, because I don't see well, them being quoted in Brian's books. Oh, well, they're not quoted. They're their sources. Not the prices. I mean, the sources. OK. Oh, OK. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, we did look up their sources. I, I don't know what altogether what was and wasn't used, what wasn't quoted in the books. Um, but all, all the, the aim was to use all the sources in everything that had been written on Joseph Smith and polygamy to gather those all up. So, um, the way that did it that usually, include, did that include things that said Joseph didn't? pursue polygamy like for example emma's dozen plus testimonies that she gave throughout her life or joseph smith the third's um consistent testimonies and work on this you know he wrote several um articles i can't remember what the old kind of scholarly journal sure. was that he was writing in but there were sure. many things 
that were being, you, you know, like Mark Twain. And I mean, there were there are lots of different sources yeah. that said that Joseph wasn't a polygamist and that it started with Brigham Young. Sure. So I'm wondering if you included sure. that aspect of re that body of research. Yeah. As well. So let me let me tell you more of how my process with Brian worked and that might answer more your question more fully. So I was the archive rat. Right. I was the one who almost always went to the archives and looked up the original sources. Brian, what he would usually do is he would pull together the secondary literature. So he would find the things that people had written about the subject of Joseph Smith and polygamy. Then he would create a master list of all the primary sources that needed to be collected together. And then I would go collect them. So there were some exceptions to this where I would just identify different various sources, but in general, Brian would figure out what sources to look up. So okay, so you were you were he was directing what you needed to go find to some extent. He, he was directing what sources to find to mm -hmm. some extent, right? Now, now some of the impetus for that came from me because I would go into the archives. And I would just look up the names of various people who were supposed to have been taught polygamy or, or been involved in polygamy in Nauvoo. And I would look for their journals or collections, letters or whatever. Um, so some of that was coming from me directly and some of it was coming from Brian's reading of the secondary sources. I remember distinctly, I mean, I, I don't think I read the prices work from cover to cover but I definitely read in parts of them, right? And I definitely remember Brian putting sources from the Price's books on the master list of sources to find. So, so in terms of were all of, were all of the denials uh, that Justice Smith practiced polygamy collected? I per perhaps not, I don't, I don't know, that would, depend on what what was on the master list okay okay so yeah i just i find it like like this is helpful to me because i really think with you know what we've learned about how the brain works and how perception works it's very difficult to find what you're not looking for right and so it is yeah yeah so it's um so i just wanted to clarify that like um there is a body of work on this other side but i didn't see it like i think Mm -hmm. um, Brian Hills and others have said to me that Emma only issued the one denial at the end of her life, which is just not true at no. all. Right. Yeah. And so and, and so there's a and that's only one piece of a whole lot of evidence. And so that's why I think that's a useful recognition oh. to have is that mm -hmm. like Brian mm -hmm. was out. Brian, Brian wasn't saying, hey, let's go look at this and see what we find. And, you know, Brian had a a theory and i would say stronger than a theory he had definitely a perspective that he was seeking to make sense of that mm -hmm. like like brian's view is joseph was a polygamist and polygamy came from god and joseph was supposed to practice polygamy so right and he did practice polygamy so let's find all of the sources mm -hmm. and then and then see where they take us within that parameter if that makes sense so yeah now necessarily in looking through all the secondary literature, he found a variety of different vantage points, right, from different authors, including the prices and others. Um, but yeah, I know exactly what you're saying about how we tend to see what we're looking for. We, we humans also tend to raise more questions about sources that don't fit our narrative than Absolutely. we do about sources that do fit our narrative. I saw that in Brian. But over time, I also came to see it in myself during the research, which I, I didn't expect. I thought, oh, I can see Brian's bias here. Well, then eventually I started seeing, well, okay, I just have the opposite bias, right? Like, oh. like it's not like it's not like I'm not biased. So so let me give for instance. So um if there were sources that said things that seemed uncomfortable, so so one area that Brian has written a lot about is what he refers to as sexual polyandry. So of course it's well known that the sources on Joseph Smith and polygamy in Nauvoo say that some of the women that he married were already legally married to other men. And so then questions arise, well, what's the nature of these relationships? Is this 
just like Brigham Young's idea you cited earlier of sort of like marrying up where a woman leaves one man and goes to another man? Or is this like a mirror image of polygyny, right? Where instead of like a one man having uh, multiple wives, this woman has multiple husbands at the same time and is having real relationships with all of them. And so that um, the idea of sexual polyandry um, was one that Brian was particularly skeptical of. So when there were sources that would say just to practice sexual polyandry, he would have me give extra scrutiny to those sources and say, well, who was the person who said this? What was their angle? Where were they coming from? And at the time, I just thought Justin Smith was a scoundrel. And so I thought in my head, I didn't say this, I thought in my head, oh, come on, Brian, like, you know, you just have to accept like that this is what happened, you know? And then I would actually look into some of those sources and find, you know what, this person did have an angle, you know, mm -hmm. they're, 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 there would be some reason to maybe be skeptical of the narrative that they're giving. So why didn't I question that? And I realized, well, it's because I had my own bias. You see what I'm saying? Sure. So I, I, I had, yeah. it was easy. It was easy to see. It's easy to see somebody else's bias. Right? Definitely. A hundred percent. And I, and I, I cop to that as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I do want to, um, do you want to ask when you say there are sources that say that Joseph practiced sexual polyandry, can you clarify that for me? Is what you mean like we have marriage dates claiming that someone was married in the state and then when we do historical work, we learn that they were already married to someone else. Oh, surprise and also pregnant. Or were the women saying, or other sources saying, I was married to this man and I was pregnant with his child, but then Joseph married me. Like like how, where, what, is, well, what is the so evidence I, for the sexual polyandry? Specifically, so the, a good example of this would be Joseph Ellis Johnson. So in 1850, Joseph Ellis Johnson in a meeting of the Quorum of the Twelve says, so he was like a brother of Benjamin F. Johnson and some of the other, the big early Mormon Johnson family. Um, Joseph Ellis Johnson meets with the Twelve and he says that Joseph had, and this is his 19th century terminology, frigged his mother-in-law, um, Mary Heron Snyder. Um, and Mary Heron Snyder was the legal wife of John Snyder. And so Brian was skeptical that Joseph actually had a sexual relationship with this woman who was legally married to this other man. And so uh, he had me look in more detail about this source. It was quoted by um, Quinn, D. Michael Quinn in his notes at Yale, uh, in his collection at the Beinecke Library at Yale. So when we were finally able to, it took a lot of work to get a copy of these meeting minutes. And when we were finally able to find a copy, it turned out that Joseph Ellis Johnson was actually on trial before the 12 himself for marrying a woman who was already married to Lorenzo Snow polygamously. Oh, well, actually, he didn't even fully marry her. He just, there wasn't a ceremony. He just had a sort of common law polygamous marriage with her and had gotten her pregnant, uh, even though she was separated from Lorenzo Snow. It was a complicated, messy story, right? But it was in that context that Joseph E. Johnson said, well, Joseph, I, I, I was the there thing. in the house when Joseph slept with my mother-in-law. So, of course... The fact that Joseph Ellis Johnson is saying this in this context doesn't necessarily mean it's not true, but it does raise more questions of, is he saying this because he's trying to get himself off the hook for his own behavior? Do you see what I'm saying? And so Brian- A hundred percent. So Brian really had, yeah, yeah. So, so Brian had been skeptical of this. And initially I thought, well, like Brian, why are you being so skeptical of the source? The guy says he was there in the house and he is the son-in-law of Mary Heron Snyder, right? Then you look at the context. Okay, well, there is some reason to, to question this. So I came to see that I had my own set of biases. And so I actually came to think that it was good that there were multiple people involved here in this research who had different biases. So, so I, I actually believe very strongly that it's good that not everybody sees things the same way, right? 
and, and part because we do have different biases, right? And so um, people having different biases contributes to a larger conversation. It's like in the sciences. Scientists do yeah. not all agree with one another. They often disagree very strongly with one another, right? And they, um, they, it's their their disagreements actually help us to That's sort how out. We put different hypotheses in competition with one another, and may the best one win. Eventually, right. the hope is that if we have an open dialogue, if we're open minded, if we use good methodology, then eventually the the truth tends to rise to the tongue, right? And so I, I know that, you know, Brian Hales um, definitely comes in for a lot of criticism. I mean, certainly um, ex-Mormons, I know, criticize him a great deal because he's defending Joseph Smith's polygamy, where they see it as this Joseph's polygamy was evilly motivated and abusive and so on. And then I, um, I, I would imagine it comes in from, for criticism from various angles. I and like I said, I I was able to see where he had biases, and then later eventually see, oh, I have them too, right? But I I have a great appreciation for the fact that, you know, the sources that Brian found that he had me dig out, he's put them on the internet, you know, right? Um, and so he's done a great service. Anyone with from coming from any vantage point on Joseph Smith and polygamy has access to many hundreds of sources that otherwise wouldn't be available. So I, I would want to give for that, like a giant hat tip to Brian for that, you know, and, and he was, I, he was wonderful as an employer to me, just, just a really great guy. Yeah. So I just, so you know, I completely agree with you. I think that like Brian Hales has helped us move this um, body of knowledge forward immensely. Yeah. And his website is a huge um, resource that I think everybody should utilize. I really appreciate it. I wanted to ask you a couple of questions. Sure. The, um, the trial notes that you found where Johnson was on trial, yeah. where did you end up finding those and how did you get access to them? So and how can we find them? <laughs> they're at the University of Utah. Um, okay. I can't remember which collection they're in. Um and I can't remember if they're on Brian's website. <laughs> Almost I didn't see everything that Brian's. he found is on Brian's website. That might have, that's, I don't remember that being in there specifically. So here, here's what happened. So it was in minutes of a meeting of the 12, but the church has different categories of restricted documents. Mm -hmm. So, um, I had requested several restricted documents when I was at, when I was doing this research I, from the church archives. And, and I've said before that I got access to all of them. I guess this, I guess that's not true. I guess this is the one that I didn't get access to. Um, but what happened is um, documents at the church archives, people tend to think documents that are restricted because they have something embarrassing in them. The church doesn't want to let them out for that reason. That was not my experience. Okay. So I requested several restricted sources and I was given access to them. And when I learned why they were restricted, documents are restricted based on category. And so the, some of the most common categories for restriction would be sacred, for instance. Okay. So if something has temple content, even if it has patriarchal blessing material in it, that's considered to be sacred. And so that's off limits unless you get permission, right? And so I, most of the documents that I requested on Justice Smith and Polygamy that were restricted were restricted because the document also had temple content in it. And all I had to do was assure the church archive staff, no, 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 really, I, you know, I don't want to use the, I'm not going to publish the mm -hmm. temple content. I just want to know the stuff about Joseph Smith and his poor wives. And they gave me permission right, to look okay. at these documents. So, I but another, hold on, another category is private. Okay. So private includes disciplinary records because as far as the church is concerned, and, and Dallany Jokes has said this publicly years ago, as far as the church is concerned, the dead are still alive. They're just in a different place. They're in the spirit world. And so we don't want to take their sins and kind of make them public knowledge, right? And okay. so 
Um, I just, Joseph, I'm sorry, I have to speak to the huge uh -huh. irony of what we're doing with Joseph Smith, right? As we say that. So anyway, continue on. That That's that's amazing when, you know, Joseph told one story his whole life and now we're telling a completely different story about him. But keep going. Go ahead. Sorry. So, so Joseph Ellis Johnson had made the statement in the context of a disciplinary council. So that automatically makes okay. it a restricted document under the private category. So the church archive staff felt like they couldn't share it with us. So I actually looked at the CD-ROM collection that they had of that showed these same minutes, but this one was blacked out. It's actually on the CD-ROM set that the church put out. They black out the part about this trial. So I was trying to look at the image from the opposite side of the page to see how much the ink bled through to see if I could read mm -hmm. it. And and I couldn't, nah. but ultimately someone at the church archives discovered that there was a copy of it at the U and sent me there to get that copy. And so even though they felt like they couldn't share their own copy because of that restriction, they were helpful in finding another copy. That's interesting. And so that's how okay. we were able to get hold of that. And so I, um, you know, like I said, I, I did all this research thinking, you know, Justice Smith wasn't a prophet, thinking he was ill-motivated. It was subsequent to this. It was about two years after I finished the research for Brian or a year and a half or so that I came back to the church. And I've heard it said from some people that I came back to the church because of my research on Justice Smith and polygamy. That sounds nuts to me. No, that's not true. <laughs> like, like, okay. I came back, I had done that research. That research didn't stop me from coming back to the church, right? So I, I did other research about the first vision, about what we can know about the last 116 pages. And I started finding really cool things that were inspiring to me that put Joseph Smith in a much more positive light than I had been seeing him in before. So, so just sort of in a nutshell, one of the big things for me was I was doing um, research on the first vision and this was, I was doing a paper for a, a class on Joseph Smith biography and autobiography that Philip Barlow taught in my master's program. And um, I, I was looking at different accounts of the first vision where Joseph Smith gave little hints that maybe the first vision was a more expanded experience than we think of it as. We think, well, he's there, he's this boy in this grove of trees and the father and the son come down to this grove of trees and the whole experience just happens in this little grove and then they go back up to heaven and he stays there. Well, Joseph says things in different accounts like, my mind was taken away from the objects which surrounded me. Well, that doesn't sound like he's not experiencing just being there in the grove, right? He's experiencing something different. He says in another account, when I came at the end of the experience, when I came to myself again, I found myself lying on my back, gazing into heaven. Well, again, this sounds like an altered state or something more than just, you know, I'm sitting there in the grove, seeing all these things happen in this natural space. Then there's a a sermon he gave in Nauvoo where he talks about the first vision and along with talking about the first vision he says any man who has gazed into heaven for five minutes knows there are three grand personages there who hold the keys of power well why is he talking about seeing into heaven when he's talking about the first vision and I started to think from various accounts that actually the first vision included a, what they what's called a heavenly ascent where like Paul talks about being caught up to the third heaven right and he sees and hears things that he can't tell other people um, this is how the Book of Mormon starts. Lehi has a first vision calling him as a prophet. A pillar of fire comes down. This is the presence of God comes down to him. Well, this is what Joseph uses this language in his first, first vision account in 1832. A pillar of fire came down. This is the presence of God. But then Lehi is lifted up to heaven where he sees God sitting on his throne, surrounded by numberless angels. In one of his accounts, Joseph talks about there were innumerable angels that he's experiencing. I started thinking, well, Maybe the first vision is, you know, God comes down to Joseph, then to Joseph to meet him on his level, then God lifts Joseph up to God's level in heaven. He has this heavenly ascent like Lehi. And I started thinking, well, that's like the whole plan of redemption, right? You know, God, Book of Mormon title page, Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God, right? God in Christ comes down to our level, right? He's made flesh for us, lifts up to lift us up to his level, 
the first vision is encapsulating this beautiful plan of redemption. I started, I was seeing that and I was seeing a number of other things that were very powerful and inspiring for me. And I started to reconsider what I had thought about Joseph Smith. I started to think more seriously about the restoration again, the possibility that it was actually legit, right? And I had had spiritual experiences before that I had dismissed. And so I started to reconsider those. I ended up, and I've talked at this, about this story, as you know, at length on other podcasts. So I, so I'll, that's just my nutshell here, right? So I, I came back to the church, right? I was rebaptized, uh, beautiful experience, being like re reaccepted, and um, like I, I am so happy that I did this, you know. I, but Michelle, when I came back to the church. I still thought Joseph Smith's polygamy was sexually motivated. I didn't okay. think it was I didn't think it was consciously sexually motivated. I thought it must have been subconsciously sexually motivated. I thought he was sincere as a prophet, but there's something wrong here. He must have been, you know, subconsciously like it's got mixed together. Motivations yeah, got mixed, mi mixed up here, right? And so, and, and I, as I was thinking about it, I thought, well, sort of like what good came out of Justice Smith's polygamy? It just, you know, there was a lot of heartbreak. There was a lot of faith crisis. And so I started really thinking like, well, maybe this was a big mistake. This is after I'm back in the church, right? Um, and so I started trying to wrestle with issues of, you know, well, can, uh, what kind of mistakes can a prophet make? and still be a prophet and so on. And, and I, I wanna come back to that because that's a big thing for me. And that's one of the things that I've really wanted to talk about in this episode. That's great, but, okay. Um, but I'll, so I'll come back to that much more fully in a minute. And my, my views on Joseph and polygamy and his motives and so on have like, they're in flux because I'm open to new information. I'm open to new perspectives, right? Um, what we have, as you know, in history, we don't have direct access to the past. What we have are models that we create, mental models, to try to piece everything together in the ways that make the most sense, in the ways that explain the greatest amount of the data in this, the simplest, most straightforward possible way. And so um, I, I came to think later that actually... Joseph's polygamy had more sincere religious motives that because I, you know, as you know, I, I found the things about how the, the first of the first few women, well, I would now argue actually that it's the first three women who are reported to have been Nauvoo plural wives of Joseph Smith were pregnant at the time that he married them. Um, and that was not what I had expected, <laughs> you know? And I, I found a source where from the 1850s, um, George Buchanan says that Joseph Smith taught not to have, for men not to have sex with their wives during pregnancy, in which case Joseph Smith himself marrying pregnant women would seem to be not about sex, but about something else. So I came to think he had more theological motives that maybe, um, this is about in part like adopting the children who would be born in these marriages, adopting them into certain covenant promises. Maybe he feels like certain things are being brought somehow through the veil with these spirits coming from the preexistence into this world. Um, I, I looked at, started looking at who the women were that he married. I mean, the first two of these women that I'm talking about, Zina Huntington and Presendia Huntington, uh, sisters, they, um, their family, they were supposed to have had an encounter with one of the three Nephites. Mary Elizabeth Rollins Leitner had had, you know, a, a poor wife soon thereafter, had had powerful spiritual experiences and so on. And I thought, well, the women he's supposed to have married often were really spiritually deep themselves. And so maybe in some way he's trying to sort of ally himself with these women who have got these spiritual experiences. And this has something to do with his own prophetic process or something. So I, when it comes to, and I've had questions about, you know, I, I talked earlier about, so what I'm saying is my sense of Joseph Smith's motives is in flux and I'm open on that. And I've also, I mentioned earlier that, you know, like if, 
Um, there are plainly the way that early Latter-day Saints were doing polygamy was very one-sided. It's very patriarchal. Well, there are people trying to live something like polygamy now, you know, it's, it's like, like, um, like polyamory, right? Where people are trying to come up with some sort of equitable way of living polygamy. And so, or, or non-monogamy as they would call it. And so, you know, if there is, if there are like ethical and more equitable ways of doing it, this still, this is not what we, this is not what I see when I look at like the, um, the way that early Latter-day Saints were practicing polygamy. I see all kinds of ethical problems there. Okay. And so, Yeah. Okay, I have so many questions. So first of all, thank you for sharing your journey and your story. That's so um, impactful and good to understand. And I think it is good for people to hear that you, um, with full knowledge of what you believe to be Joseph's polygamy, came back to the church. I think that's, if I'm hearing correctly, that's yeah. part of what you want to share is this does oh, not yeah. have to totally. break your faith. This, totally. this is not a deal breaker for faith. There Absolutely. are plenty right. of reasons to believe. Okay, right. so I appreciate that. And I think that's, and I do want to talk about kind of navigating faith with a different model as well, you know, sure. totally. but um, I guess with my questions about, so, so first of all, the questions about polyandry and your way of kind of exploring that if Joseph was trying to align, you know, I know you're just throwing out possibilities of what right. it might be. Right. So these women, when you found out that they were pregnant, when they married mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me that, how you discover, like, again, I want to make the point that the women weren't saying when I was, after I had married so-and-so and I was this many months pregnant with his child, I married Joseph for it, right? Wasn't it that you found whatever affidavit that was written that they may or may not have signed in 69 or, or you know, a testimony that was given kind of on their behalf that they were to some degree a party to maybe. And then you also found the dates when they had children and dates when they married other people, right? So, um, right. So th this will get to questions that we'll explore in the next episode of. Oh, uh, okay. We can uh, wait. Well, well uh, questions of how do we do history, right? Like, right. Like what, what does, what is history as a discipline, right? What is history in terms of like piecing things together and how do we do it? And, and so, yeah, you're right. I, I mean, what we're dealing with here is we do have historical sources where people say things, but then we're also tasked to line up the historical data in order to create a chronology that those sure. people themselves are not creating for us because they're giving us a snippet here and a snippet there. So we're the ones who have to put it in order. And then we're the ones who have to look and see well, what are the patterns and what they're telling us. And so as I'll talk about in the next episode, much of history is just getting the events in the right order, right? Once we have the events in the right order, the cause and effect relationships just emerge, the patterns emerge, we can watch the dominoes fall. So yeah, that, that would be something that I'd love to talk about in detail in, okay. the, in our next conversation, yeah. Okay, thank you. So yeah, we'll go into that next time. And then my other question on what you were talking about with Joseph marrying the pregnant women and coming up with theories of that, does that give you pause at all for their husbands, the fathers of these children? Like, Yes, okay, yes. So- Here's something, this is, it's, this is all complex and it's all messy. Hey, right, right. And so I have heard the argument that if Joseph Smith was not having sex with the women he's polyandrously sealed to, then, then see no problem there, right? There's, there's no ethical problem. I still think that's very ethically problematic. If I found out, I'm not married right now, but if I were and I found out that Russell M. Nelson had secretly had himself sealed to my wife for eternity so that I was only going to be with her for this life and he was going to have her forever, I'd be flipping furious. That would not be okay with me. And so I don't, I, I'm not saying that's not ethically problematic or, gee, this sounds great. No, 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 no. But I am just trying to see, like, when we look at the, I, I'm just trying to figure out what the historical sources are saying. I'm not saying, gee, gee this sounds just right. Gee, this sounds so ethical and okay. perfect. 
<laughs> you're right. looking at the sources and then taking what the sources say and saying, how do I make the best sense of this for my own faith navigation is, is what I'm hearing. So I'm not. Well, well I'm first not I'm trying to them. make sense of them historically, just right. like what, what, what is it that happened? What, what is Joseph Smith thinking? What's happening? Then secondarily, what are the people involved thinking? And then after that, sort of like, well, then obviously questions arise. What do I think? What do I think about what happened ethically, spiritually, theologically, personally? But that's sort of the, that's like the last layer. Sure. Because obviously, if I'm trying to make judgments on what ha personal judgments on what happened and I don't have a good idea of what happened, then my judgments are going to be off. And so first step, and the one that I place the most emphasis on as a historian is just getting the events in the right order and trying to figure out, create the best model for what happened. Sure. And I know this goes into part two as well, but that part even itself is tricky, right? Because for example, and I won't remember the Johnson guy's first name. What was his Joseph, name that was on trial? Joseph, Joseph, Joseph Ellis Johnson, yeah. Joseph Ellis Johnson. So Joseph Ellis Johnson, you could take his testimony and build into the timeline and the chronology. Oh, Joseph Smith with his mother, with Joseph F., Joseph Johnson's mother-in-law, right? Right. Or you can look at it and go, what's the motivation of this source? How trustworthy and reliable is it? Is it backed up by other things? Is it more sure. like, like, yeah. so even while we're building our chronology, we are rating validity of sources, right? We are making decisions about, we, so, so I just wanted to throw that in. We, I know we we'll are get always making later. decisions about, how much weight to give or yes. not to give to a given source. Yeah. Right. Okay. Absolutely. And so at this point, where are you on Joseph's polygamy? Are you, cause I've, I have heard you talking about sort of prophets can be really messed up. They can do terrible things and still be prophets, you know? So are you kind of feeling like he was like, like, I think Brian, I've heard him say, and I don't, I'm not, don't want to imply that you guys share the same perspective on any, everything, but I've heard him say that um, if he could go back and give Joseph advice, he would tell him to do polygamy very differently, you know? So I think that Brian yeah. thinks that polygamy was definitely of God and was commanded, but Joseph did it clumsily in some instances. Is that kind of your perspective as well? I would probably lean more that direction at this point. Um I definitely think that, again, my primary effort is really to understand, to try to understand what Joseph Smith was doing and why he was doing it. And so while I do have personal judgments, I mostly keep those more in the background because I am a historian and my job as a historian is primarily to try to figure out what happened. Um, and so I want to, to a great extent, put my personal perspectives aside or at least in the background so that I can try to figure out the past without personal lenses getting in the way, right? Because ultimately, at, for me as a historian, it doesn't matter what I think when I'm looking at what it doesn't matter how I feel about polygamy when I'm looking at the sources, right? What matters right, I agree is with that. what actually happened. And so that's what I most want to get at is what happened. And so I, I've come to think that Joseph's motives were much more than sex, even though I had thought when I came, even when I came back to the church, that subconsciously this was the primary motivation. I've come to think he had more theological, spiritual, prophetic motives for this. And trying to understand that will be the subject of some future some projects that I'm working on that I'd eventually plan to publish right and see how they play out as I pursue those ideas um but I don't feel the need to say that what Joseph Smith did was necessarily right or the best way to do things okay so I am curious to know um sure. so and I and there and we can come back to all of these like I love circling around on all yeah, of these topics sir sure. Um, how do you see the, the, the model that Joseph Smith was honest and Brigham Young, polygamy started with, um, other leaders, Brigham Young and others. Yeah. How do you see that as more destructive to faith than the model that Joseph Smith was, um, originated polygamy and, and betrayed Emma and was lying about it, you know, cause 
even if even even though Brigham, if even if we have the model that Brigham started polygamy, he wasn't doing the same kind of shenanigans of going behind his wife's back and uh, right. lying publicly. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, a, a lot of them did lie, you know, like who was it? Was it Joseph F. Smith or someone else that in England read out of Section 101, the original Section 101 yeah. and then mm -hmm. to deny polygamy? So we know that there mm -hmm. was still. But, but I, I, I guess that's my first question is. Why do you see the Brigham Young model as more destructive to faith than the Joseph Smith model? So, okay, so let me comment on that. And then I'd like to pivot back to kind of Ooh. where I see us, where we were a minute ago, sure. and then pivot back to that, this question again. So I would actually say, I don't, I don't know that it's more challenging to faith. I think it's challenging to faith in a different way. And mm -hmm. so maybe a way to get at that would be to talk about how I see the my own wrestles with because my own wrestles with the question was was Joseph right in practicing polygamy thinking Joseph practiced polygamy but then at times having thought but he was totally wrong in doing so then how did I sort of manage that and how do I think other people might manage that vantage point. And then I think that talking about, well, what if it's, what if we see it as Brigham Young who started polygamy, then how would we manage that in terms of faith? So um, I, so at, at present, I do think that Joseph has, I think Joseph practiced polygamy and that he did it out of like that. I, I mean, we're, he was human and all humans have mixes of motives. That's just part of being a human being. Um, the reason you do this podcast probably is not one single reason, but a set of reasons, right? And sure. so I think it would be wrong to try to see Joseph Smith as he's just a very simple person who just has one single motive for everything he does or something that that's not how humans work. But I think that Joseph does have, I see him now as having spiritual motives that polygamy in some way might be sort of part of his prophetic practice and so on, while also seeing ethical issues with his polygamy. But because when I came back to the church, I saw Joseph's polygamy as sexually motivated, at least unconsciously, um, I had to wrestle a lot with questions about, well, how could that be? How could he be like a prophet if you know, he, he made this mistake, right? And so, um, you know, one of the things that I see in this regard, you know, like um, a couple of years ago when uh, in Sunday school, we were going through Genesis. I remember I was in gospel doctrine one time and the, the class members were talking about, was it, I can't remember, maybe it was like Isaac and Rebecca and giving like the like the the deception that happens with like the birthright, the birthright and, Jacob. And, all uh -huh. this. and people kept trying to justify the actions that were taken and say well this it wasn't really deceptive because of this and that. it was plainly deceptive right but they're saying it's not really deceptive because of this and that and eventually i just the steam was rising from my ears kind of you know i wasn't really mad but i was like frustrated like and so I raise my hand and I give this long comment, right? And then like, well, you know, when we look in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, you know, we've got Noah comes off the ship and gets drunk. And then when his, you know, son uncover, you know, sees him naked, he curses his grandson, which doesn't seem to make any sense at all, you know, and then with servitude, slavery, right? And then, you know, you've got um, Abraham, you know, his his family is like anything but a picture of domestic tranquility, right? And you've got- Because um, of polygamy. Because of polygamy, right? Right. And um, then you've got, you know, Isaac and Rebecca doing these, you know, this major- We should just cut right to it. Judah children. and Tamar. Judah and Tamar is the best of the whole thing. Right, exactly. Like like this, I remember reading that story as a teenager and just being baffled, you know, the whole thing. And so, so Jacob's sons are just an absolute mess. How, you know, they, they, they. Well, they commit genocide as well. They have multiple genocides. 
Right, 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 right. And and even even a hero figure like Joseph, Joseph was a total snot who thinks his brothers should are less than him. And you know, I I, I don't know. I mean, the the David and Solomon, Solomon's the wisest man in the world. And what does he do with that? Well, he he marries the wives of all these foreign gods and sets up idols in God's temple that God had had him build. And you go uh, even down into the New Testament, right? Peter denies Christ three times right after saying, I will never deny you, you know, and the apostles look during Jesus' lifetime, at least like a bunch of clowns, you know, and like the Bible is not trying to show, it's not a book of heroes. It's not a book of heroes. It's not a book of exemplars trying to show us these people were so perfect. They were so great. Be just like Abraham, just be just like Solomon. No, 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 no. Yeah. There is, well, hold on, there, there's a protagonist. There is an exemplar in the Bible. It's not any right. of those guys. It's Christ. He's our exemplar. Is, there, the, is the it, protagonist of the Bible is God. It's not trying to show us, be like all these flawed human beings. It's actually showing us human beings are flawed. Your, well, your, your model should be something higher. So, so just like, I don't want to derail you. I, I guess as you're describing this, I kind of think maybe it's to me more useful to view the Bible as a book, not of heroes, but a book of patterns, right? A book that shows us like when I see Peter deny Christ three times, I see Joseph giving the manuscript paper away. Mm. I see, right. That mm. was a, that was a faith promoting experience mm. for Joseph actually, because the repentance was so bitter of that, just like mm -hmm. Peter, that it would never right. happen again. And mm -hmm. I find those patterns in my life too. And, and it, you see patterns of God commands mm -hmm. marriage between one man and one woman. And whether we follow Lamech's pattern or Abraham and Sarah's desire to have a child that resulted in their polygamy, right. That was not mm -hmm. commanded by God or, heaven forbid, Jacob's awful polygamy as being tricked by his deceptive and horrible father-in-law, right? We see, mm -hmm. wow, when you diverge from the commandments given to God, horrors await, like horrors ensue. It's not a good pattern, right? So I, that's what I guess I think. And, and Abraham also sets the pattern of repentance and, and desire to serve God, and right? So I guess I hear what you're saying. I just want to be careful of sort mm -hmm. of um, saying the danger I hear what you're saying personally of like, look, all of these guys are flawed. It's kind of like, it doesn't matter. God uses anyone and we can all be flawed or we don't have to like, like I just read a speech by Hiram Smith. that was recorded. I think in Levi, is it Levi, Levi Hancock? Richards. Levi, Levi Richards, Richards book mm -hmm. where, where Hiram says that God would not allow prophets to sin too deeply. He would, you know, I, I can't remember the wording. I'll have to look that up again. Mm -hmm. but, and there is something to me where I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant to compare Joseph Smith to say Judah and Tamar, right? Like we, we, people use these models to say, look, God wouldn't, I mean, people who are very pro polygamy will say to me, um, God wouldn't have his son born through a line that did these awful corrupt things. I'm like, like you, have mm -hmm. you read about Judah and Tamar or about mm -hmm. all of the massive genocides mm -hmm. and all of the terrible things that happened through like mm -hmm. every one of us mm -hmm. has horrors mm -hmm. in our line somewhere. Right. We're not accountable for those. Right. But at the right. same time, when we're, so when we're talking about the genealogy, sure. But when we're talking about the individual, I, I see Peter denying Christ three times, the same as Joseph giving away the manuscript, not the same as breaking your wife's heart and lying consistently and excommunicating people for the same thing that you're doing in secret. And, you, you know, like, I think there's a whole different level there of, of a pattern of learning and repentance versus just sin. If that makes sense, but but I didn't mean to derail you. I just wanted to express why yeah. I kind of why that's a challenge for me to view it that way. Sure. Um, I, I mean, so so the the gist, right, of what I was pointing out is that you know the the Bible is not meant to be a book of exemplars. It has an exemplar in it. Okay. Right? We have someone who's chosen to be our exemplar, and that's Christ. It's not just because God chose him. Mean, God chose Abraham. God chose the house of Israel. But when we look at the specific lives of, you know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob's sons, right? They're a mess. And I think that actually this does play into the New Testament narrative of, 
grace, right? That we, we as human beings, we are flawed and that this is, I, I, I know this, I don't think it's an accident that the Bible shows us the flaws of the various prota human protagonists. I think that's actually part of the design of the Bible is that it's supposed to show us that human beings are imperfect. And so we have a perfect exemplar in Christ and we have grace through Christ. And so when I look at prophets, I don't see that or people chosen by God, I don't see like a necessity for them to be toward some standard of perfection. I I see a necessity for a trajectory like like Joseph in Egypt was different from his brothers. And and I know that we can view him as a young snot, maybe, you know, but maybe he was also someone who was having these experiences from God, trying to understand what they meant and not necessarily mm -hmm. trying to offend his older brothers. And, you know, just trying to say, I had this dream, which mm -hmm. he had, you know, but then as he goes to Egypt, we look at his humility and his faithfulness and his continued faith and his his trajectory that he was on was always one like he did learn extreme humility in Egypt right but then he was elevated but it's it's like and the lord chose him the the challenge i have is if we say you know god can like like here's the thing if we see problems with polygamy we have to decide who the problem is with right was the sure. problem with joseph did he do something sure. wrong was the problem with Brigham Young at all? You know, I'm not saying it's just Brigham Young, but that cabal of polygamists, did they do something wrong? Or was the problem with God? Mm -hmm. And God chose Joseph, and God continued mm -hmm. to choose Joseph, even as Joseph was doing these things. And jo God's like, I'm okay with it. Well, that raises huge problems. Like, as a woman who reads Jacob 2 and sees how, why God condemns polygamy, we take verse 30 out of context and leave alone sure. that God condemns polygamy because of what it does to God's daughters. Sure. God cares about women and the experiences of women and girls, which polygamy affects girls the same way, because I'm not comfortable calling a 14 year old a woman, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. And so if we are saying, dad, Joseph wasn't perfect, but you know, prophets aren't perfect. That raises problems for me with God, if that makes sense. Like, yeah. I'm sorry, if God is okay with this, then I'm not okay with God. If, if, if I'm Emma and what Joseph was doing was true and yet he's still the prophet and God's still talking to him, then what am I? Mm -hmm. Who am I? Why doesn't God care about me? Right. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So I'm not trying to destroy your model. I'm trying to explain why it, why it doesn't work for me. Why it's, and, and I also want to clarify, I don't come, I, I believed Joseph was a polygamist my whole life. I had my own ways mm -hmm. of, I, I was fine with it. When I say I was fine with it, I mean, I had dealt, I, that's a complicated thing to say. I assumed that the reason Joseph was killed was because he lost his spiritual protection because he dabbled in polygamy. That was kind of my perspective on it, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not that I that I have to save my faith somehow by blaming Brigham Young. It's not that at all. It's I got into the research and was like, "Wow, mm -hmm. this is different than I thought." But so I so I wanted to clarify that just to say this sure. is why I find that explanation of faith to be challenging because sure. it says it's God's fault and God will just use anyone. Right. And and so if so, if there's some guy that's tormenting you and torturing you and doing horrible things to you, well, he might be God's prophet because, you know, prophets aren't perfect. Mm -hmm. That's my challenge. So. Sure. So when you did think when you first had started this podcast, the first year ish of this podcast, when you were thinking polygamy is not right, polygamy is not of God. But Justice Smith practiced polygamy. How did you square those two? That Joseph Smith was a prophet, but he taught and practiced something that wasn't of God. Yeah. So I just just quickly, not just to go back further, I, I was raised believing polygamy was of God. And that it was a beautiful right. thing that we just right. didn't understand. I didn't have the normal right. problems, you know very naive. And then I went on my path of learning that polygamy was not of God. As I studied Joseph Smith, it looked to me like he wasn't doing the same thing that Brigham Young was doing. I knew it wasn't the same, sure. but I also knew he dabbled in it and I couldn't yeah. get away from that. I couldn't escape. There were certain pieces that I was like, I can't get past mm -hmm. this. He did. He was messing around with this to what extent I don't know. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and that's what I thought. I thought that's why he, I, I had had a conversation with somebody who had also dabbled in it and told me that 
like his experience was that he lost his spiritual protection. And that's why he was allowed to be excommunicated, right? So that was like, oh, that worked. Okay, I think Joseph Smith lost his spiritual protection. And that's why he was allowed to be killed. So that's how I, I thought polygamy was wrong. Joseph was a prophet. He got mixed up and messed up mm -hmm. in this. And, okay. and I didn't consider him a fallen prophet. I would have never used that word. I just thought, you know, I mean, it, it wasn't that sure. certainly investigated. I mean, I hadn't thought through every detail of it, but that was my, that was my um, sure. perspective sure. on it. Sure. Yeah. So, so what I'm trying to lay out, I think would align with that, that, I'm not saying that this is how entirely how I see it at the moment, right? Because like I said, I see, I now see more spiritual motives. I'm more open to uh, in that regard. But like, like I said, when I came back to the church, I was taking the view that the polygamy was wrong. It was a mistake. So then how do I square that with Joseph Smith being a prophet? Okay, this was your part experience. Of, okay. Part of how I see that is, by looking at um, a larger pattern of scripture where God does use very flawed people, even when I might prefer otherwise, right? Like I might want God to use people who would just be shining examples. So that's very um, complicated. And I can just look at the various figures in the scriptures and be like, hey, I, I can follow that guy's example and I'm safe. And this, this takes me somewhere. That, that what we actually see in scripture and in human history is just a lot of human messiness, right? And this mm -hmm. God, God, to some extent or other works with that. So, so whatever the degree of Joseph Smith's life mistakes was or wasn't, Joseph Smith's a flawed human being that God is using. He's not some semi-perfect God, right? Like, and, and so Joseph Smith's own revelations acknowledge this, right? I mean, he, Right. He gets called to repentance so many times, right? And told he's he's forgiven for this or that. It's acknowledging that he made mistakes. So, so again, what what whatever the degree of his mistakes, whether one sees him having practiced polygamy and that being a mistake or not, like Joseph Smith is human. There's messiness. So for me, looking at the the scriptural record, particularly the Bible, right? That I I fit that in right like like joseph smith so um joseph smith oh okay here's a narrative hey uh a young man sees god and he could ask god for anything but what he asks him for is wisdom and god gives him wisdom who is that young man well so, um solomon right solomon it's joseph smith as well right oh, joseph it, smith right okay both of them, right it's it's both of them and so um, Joseph Smith, in that way, is sort of like a Latter-day Solomon, right? He, he, he asks God, he sees God, he asks God for wisdom, God gives him wisdom. Well, the biblical Solomon goes on to make massive mistakes far beyond anything that Joseph Smith does. Joseph Smith doesn't yeah. set up idols to worship in the temple or, you know, whatever, false gods. Um, and so I look at well, Solomon's the guy that God gave wisdom to that he allowed to build his house for him for the first time, build, build Israel's temple. And so for me, at least looking at that kind of backdrop, I'm able to say, hey, Joseph Smith could have made massive mistakes too, because God uses people, even people who make big mistakes. And so um, I, I don't fully know why right but that's that's how i that's how i see that um okay. yeah and and so i want to, i want to move on to this i just want to like sure. so sure, my sure, concern sure. there because i think that what polygamy really hits at is people's faith in god and so mm -hmm. that's my concern with that perspective oh, is i think okay. it minimizes god like i do struggle like samuel the prophet and his sons and the horrible things they were doing i don't like that story at all i grapple with that i don't know the answers i don't look at david and solomon as heroes at all right so yes mm -hmm. it's just it, for me i'd rather um um for me since i don't even like that model i don't want to fit joseph smith into that model right i'd rather yeah. just like go forget god like that's mm. not my God, right? That that does this kind of stuff and is fine with it. So so I appreciate, I, I just wanted to, like, like we can continue. Sure. I'm not trying to challenge you. I'm just, I appreciate yeah, sure, that sure, that sure, model sure. works for you. I oh, wanted okay, to okay. express why it's a challenge for me, but continue. Sure. Okay. okay. 
So, so I mean, the, the Hebrew Bible does describe, I think you used the word genocide earlier, um, describes mm -hmm. the, the people of Israel going out and wiping out other groups of people, right? And so um, it looks to me like God's level of toleration for his people's, his chosen people's errors is high. Okay, um, and I would interpret like, that very differently, but can, yeah, yeah, but go ahead. With um, your, yeah. So, um, I, I guess um, something that I see, and I think we talked about this once briefly on the phone or something related, is that I do see people sometimes making arguments that, like, if if Joseph Smith did such and such, then he couldn't have been a prophet, right? He wasn't a prophet. And like, um, so I remember seeing um, Stephen Robinson, who was a BYU professor, wrote like Believing Christ and so on about mm -hmm. grace. He wrote something once arguing against an idea that Blake Osler came up with. So Blake Osler came up with this idea. He was trying to explain, Blake Osler was trying to explain, well, why does the Book of Mormon have language in it from Joseph Smith's time from the revivals? Why does it use the the, the 1611 King James version of the Bible, why does it have things that seem out of place in the ancient world? And he came up with what he calls an expansion theory of the Book of Mormon, that when God reveals things, and like an ancient text, he kind of updates it in some ways to the modern world. And so Stephen Robinson was critiquing that idea, was criticizing that and saying that can't be. And Stephen Robinson said, if the Book of Mormon has anything in it that's not ancient, then it's false. Oh, and, oh, okay. And so I look at an argument like that and I think if you're trying to defend the restoration, why would you ever make an argument whose conclusion is then it's false, right? Mm -hmm. And so I remember, um, I think back before I was born, like, I don't know, Hugh Nibley wrote something about, like, I think um, somebody had discovered a document relating to Justice Smith's 1826 hearing for glass looking where he was put on trial basically for using a seer stone. Um, it was considered to be against the law, surprisingly, right? And Hugh Nibley wrote, if this were true, it would be the most damning evidence so far against the prophet Joseph Smith. Well, then it was found that the, the document was genuine, the trial, the hearing actually did occur Right. And I've seen other kinds of arguments like this. I remember Brian making an argument that if Joseph Smith engaged in sexual polyandry, it would have been adultery and he would have been a false or fallen prophet. And I just don't like arguments that conclude with, sure. therefore, Joseph Smith would not be a prophet or the restoration wouldn't be true. I just think those arguments are a bad idea because then you have like maybe let's take Stephen Robinson's argument, then the Book of Mormon would be false. Well, then all that a critic needs to do is argue that there's something in the Book of Mormon that's not ancient. And they've made, right. they've used a lot, they've enlisted a Latter-day Saint. They quote the Latter-day Saint and they enlist the Latter-day Saint to argue, see, it's not true, right? Right. And so yeah. I, I hesitate with sort of dichotomous arguments to say, well, if Joseph Smith practiced polygamy, if Joseph Smith did this in his polygamy, then he wasn't a prophet because I'm not trying to convince people Joseph Smith wasn't a prophet. I think Joseph Smith was a prophet, right? And so even if Joseph Smith made various mistakes, that's how I would see it is that he was a prophet who made mistakes rather than, right, that he wasn't a prophet. And so one of the things okay. that I've um, thought a lot about is that, like, um, what is it that Latter-day Saints are required to believe? And what are they not required to believe with regard to polygamy, with regard to other things, right? When I was a teenager, I encountered this book. It was an anthropological look at Mormonism by a non-Mormon. It was called uh, The Roots of Modern Mormonism. And I just opened up this book. I'm thumbing through it. And he said something about how Mormonism has a do-it-yourself theology. And I did not know what he was talking about. He I, I re read this and reread this. He was talking about like Mormons aren't really required to believe this or that. And they sort of come up with their own theological understandings oh, on their okay. own. And I was like, I was thinking about like 
how I read like Bruce R. McConkie's Mormon doctrine. He lays down the law, right? Well, this is the way it is. You have to believe this. All true saints through all the ages of eternity have believed this true doctrine, you know, and so on. And years later, I um, I decided that I wanted to learn more about Catholicism. And my my adoptive dad had grown up Catholic. And so I took Catholic catechism classes, what, are, what Catholics call RCIA classes, to learn about Catholicism. And on the very first day of class, Michelle, they gave us this book titled The Catechism of the Catholic Church, which I was told contained all the required beliefs for salvation, everything that you had to believe to be saved. It's this thick. It's like three and a half inches or four inches thick. It has thousands of specific doctrinal beliefs. They're called dogmas. Dog, yeah. A dogma actually means a required belief, something you have to believe to be saved. And I was told that if you didn't believe all these things, that even if you were a Catholic in good standing, you were de facto ex spiritually excommunicated from the faith by not believing these. And I thought, well, then there are no real Catholics, because basically how many people could, how many people even know about all these beliefs and could hold them all in their heads? You know, I, I just mm -hmm. so then I suddenly understood what this anthropologist had been saying years earlier, that Mormonism has a kind of do-it-yourself theology. I just came to realize Latter-day Saints actually have considerable freedom of belief. If you look at the number of belief questions in the Temple Recommend interview, I think it's like the Father, Three Son, and Holy ones. Ghost. What? Mm -hmm. the, Three main ones, right? Right. Joseph the, Smith and the Restoration and the current leadership. Right, right. And then... That's it. And the rest of it's about how you live your life. Mm. And so Mormons are what they call orthoprax, meaning it's about your practice, your behavior, rather than orthodox, it being about you know, your beliefs. And so when I, uh, I went on a mission, when I was on my mission, one of the guys we taught was he was coming from a Catholic background and he accepted everything, everything that we said, except in the lesson on the great apostasy, he could not accept that the Catholics had lost the authority. He thought that the Latter-day Saints had the authority, but he also thought the Catholics still had the authority, both. And so we talked to our mission president, can we baptize this guy? Because he wanted to be baptized. And the mission president laughed and said, we have members in Japan who still worship their ancestors. Go ahead and baptize them, right? And so there is considerable latitude for belief as a Latter-day Saint Nowhere in the Temple Recommend interview was there a question, do you believe polygamy is a true doctrine or, or, you know, do you believe that in the next life you'll have to live in a polygamous marriage or, you know, um, it's not in the Articles of Faith, right? It's... Um, and Joseph it's, Smith himself taught against creeds. Joseph Smith himself, like exactly. that guy that was quoting that was probably quoting Joseph Smith that, no, you're, we're not a gospel of creeds. We weren't right. meant to be. Yeah, exactly. And so, as far as I'm concerned, Latter-day Saints don't have to believe that polygamy was right. They, they can believe that it was right. They can believe that it was wrong. They can hold, there's a whole spectrum of beliefs that they might hold about polygamy, right? And, or about marriage or the ideal form of marriage. It's, it's not a requirement for salvation. It's not a requirement to be to join the church. It's not a requirement to take the sacrament. It's not a requirement to get a temple recommend. And so I see this as being something very open where people, they're able to, to arrive at their own views. They're able to revise those views as their life experience changes and they learn new things. And that's, that's fine. That's okay. I love Nothing that. And that. I think that's that how it should be. Yeah. And really, in a way, our faith is so much more real and vibrant and strong when it's between us and God, because we've been forced to wrestle, right? Exactly. Like if, if it all were just clean and if it, if the whitewashed version we had been given were true, many like, like, yes, less faith would have deconstructed, but really the goal isn't for faith to deconstruct. It's for faith to reconstruct in a more profound right. Right. connected way. Like I would right. say that having learned more truth rather than the whitewashed fantasy, my faith is much more profound and I know God much better than I did before. Yeah. Amen. And that's, that's I, I feel that way exactly as well. Okay. Yes. 
Yes. Okay. And I think yeah. that that's part of why God, you know, the fact is God's in charge. So wherever yeah. the mess ups happen, God allowed them. Right. And yeah. the question is why. And for me, I just keep coming to the back to the, to the answer because it's not actually about an institution. It's about the individual. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's not that the church needs to be something other. It's what am I? Where does yes. God want me to be? What does God know um, will be in my best good, the best good of those around me? Where right. can I be of most use to God? And where will my life be blessed the most? And, and that's where I want to be. And then how can I best serve God wherever God has planted me, has told me to be, right? So for me, that's where it comes down to. And whether whether polygamy was right, which I, I, I thoroughly reject that at this point, even though that was my belief, whether it was Joseph Smith or whether it was Brigham Young, the question is, where does God want me? Because because really mm -hmm. the buck stops mm -hmm. with God. God could it's have right. done it differently. God could right. have said, no, we're not messing around with David and Solomon. No, we're not messing around with Brigham Young or whoever right. it may be, right? And so right. anyway, so that's part of my way of navigating it. Like yeah. in a way, when you said everyone has mixed motives, I do think there's truth to that, but I do think that it's possible to have at your core, I just want to do what God wants me to yeah. do. And yeah. I, I know yeah. I've been given the chance to answer that question with my podcast when I've had to consider what I took it down. If I, you, you know, and really mm -hmm. my answer is just, I want to do whatever God wants me to do. So Wonderful. that's what my answer would be. And I do think that was Joseph Smith's answer too. I, I tend to think that really his answer was, I want to do what God wants me to do. Now that doesn't mean I that any so. of us are perfect. Yeah. In that, but I do think that could be a central motivator. Anyway, I spoke for a while, so yeah, no, I, 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 I loved everything that you said, everything that you said, and I think, and I agree. My view of Joseph Smith, and 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 I, I come from a past of having deeply questioned his motives, and for a while, seen them as bad. But the more that I've pieced together things, not primarily on polygamy, that's part of it, right? But just in his life in general. What does he? What does it look like? He's trying to do. I see him as deeply spiritually motivated, right? He does. He wants to follow God's will. I see indications that he's actually even looking at the world around him for signs of divine providence to help him understand what God wants him to do. And then I think that's would a charlatan do that? A, an opportunist doesn't care what the universe wants him to do. He doesn't right. care what God wants him to do. He only cares what he wants, right? But well, that's mm -hmm. not what I see in Joseph Smith at all. I see a deep religious sincerity in him. And and I and and so I I very much resonate with what you were saying about Joseph Smith and that like each of us like you know we need to have our own spiritual motives. We need to have our own relationship with God. And whatever happened and and you know in this episode even in the next episode my aim is not going to be to convince people that Joseph Smith practiced polygamy, my aim is going to be for us to have a good conversation, a dialogue, right, where maybe we build some bridges of understanding. I do want to explain why do I think, right, my approach is sure. historian, that Joseph Smith did practice polygamy, but with the caveat that I think he did practice polygamy, right, like whether Joseph started polygamy or whether we see, or whether Brigham started polygamy, or whoever started playing me, I think the same kinds of considerations would apply, that this was not a surprise to God, that God has an overall providential view. So just like God knew that the Jews in ancient Israel were going to re reject Jesus, just like God knew that the man that he chose to build the temple, Solomon, right, was going to pollute that very same temple, just like God knew that the house of Israel that he was choosing way back, you know, uh, 3,500 years ago or whatever it was, like was um, flawed. These were flawed human beings. He would have known what Joseph Smith's flaws would be, would have known what Brigham Young's flaws would be. God's not surprised by any of this. There's a larger picture that God understands. So then the question comes down to us individually. What are we supposed to be doing with our lives within the framework of this larger plan? I love it. Okay, Don, I have loved this conversation. Should we wrap it up here? Yeah, and then let's do. 
And okay, this I, I hope that you guys all found this as enjoyable as I did. I really appreciate you coming on and talking to me. And I think that the, um, the listeners will be very eager to hear our next installment where we are going to talk more about the work of historians and getting into the historical models and um, hopefully some of the evidence. And we'll see where see we'll see where that conversation takes us. Absolutely. But thank you so much for being here. And I look forward you, to talking Michelle. again. Another huge thank you to Don Bradley for coming and having this conversation. It has been tricky to try to pin him down, so I'm really thankful that he was willing to come. I know that he wanted to start on faith, and that was maybe not the conversation some people wanted to hear, but I thought it turned into an excellent conversation and sets a good foundation for our continuing conversations going forward. So I am really excited to continue this dialogue, and I invite you to all come along with us. We'll see you next time.